here's the the big thing that I wanted to talk about today. Now, I um full disclaimer, I don't love doing segments like this. I don't love doing segments where you watch someone else's thing and, and then dissect it. But The Hill did a piece recently on net neutrality and I was very surprised that it was even published and very disappointed. It is so out there on net neutrality and misrepresents what net neutrality really is, misrepresents the history of net neutrality, misrepresent how long we've had net neutrality. And, and these are a lot of the things that I talk about a lot on this show. And these are talking points that have been knocked down for years, for years now. And you see a platform as huge as the Hill just repeating them. And it's very frustrating to see because in the cable news sphere, you see virtually no coverage on net neutrality. Gee, I wonder why. Could it be because Comcast owned, owns MSNBC? Could it be because Time Warner uh, is uh, in collaboration with CNN? Could it be because Rupert Murdoch is against net neutrality? I mean, I, it's not hard to see why. So we're going to go through this segment from the Hill and uh, kind of go through each piece. We're not going to watch the whole thing, but I'm kind of just going to start it and then we're going to talk about it and we're going to take it from there. All right. So here it goes. This is the piece from the Hill. And this this came out about a week ago. Robbie, what's on your radar? Exactly four years ago, as of yesterday, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, repealed the Internet regulation known as net neutrality, which had forced Internet service providers to treat all content identically in terms of download and streaming speeds, for instance. Now, since the popular policy had come into existence during the Obama administration and was... Okay, we're going to stop right there. He calls it a popular policy, which is true. It is a very popular policy, and we're going to get more into that later. Um, it did not come into existence during the Obama administration. In fact, later in this spiel, spiel, he admits that it did not come to exist. We've had net neutrality. Uh, the, the term originated in 2003 and we've had, we've been pushing for net neutrality since then. And internet service providers were expected to follow net neutrality rules. We just got it solidified on the books as an actual solid law, instead of just something like, hey, cable companies, you're going to follow this. Hey, no, we're not. Let's duke it out in court. We got it as a law on the books during the Obama era. But to say that that we've only known a net neutrality internet since Obama and during those few years during the Obama administration is incredibly misleading. We have had net neutrality since the beginning of the internet we do not know what the internet is like in a post-net neutrality world, even though it's been repealed a few years ago. Well, why don't we know what it's like, Ron, if it was repealed a few years ago? Why hasn't a lot changed? Because people have been fighting on the front lines against big cable, and certain states, California, where I live, being one of them, have passed net neutrality laws. So when you have certain states where net neutrality laws still exist, and they're big states like California, like New York, well, the cable companies, their hands are kind of tied because they can't unroll anti-net neutrality packages because they wouldn't be able to unroll them in places with big customer bases. That's why we haven't seen the effects of a post-net neutrality world. You want to know why the internet is still the way you know it? Thank a freaking digital rights activist because that is why. Uh, all right. So right there, just just know this did not start with Obama and and. All right, we're going to continue because I kind of jumped ahead here, but but he says some other stuff here. Gutted during President Trump's reign, its demise was treated as, well, the end of the Internet as we know it by panic-stricken resistance liberals. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi predictably said the Republican attack on net neutrality was an attack on, you guessed it, democracy itself. The free and open Internet is a pillar, a pillar of so many things, our democracy, our economic possibilities, entrepreneurship, and the rest, creating opportunities and empowering communities. What isn't an attack on democracy? Okay, so now this uh, Robbie Swove 
uh, gentlemen. I, I do not know much about him. I probably don't even know how to pronounce his name. I bet I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, I know very little about the guy because this isn't about him. This is about this segment. Um, but this is something I want to point out. So he said there that this is a big issue of, quote, resistance liberals. And, and then he he played that Nancy Pelosi segment, um, kind of making it out like, oh, net neutrality is some is some, you know, shit lib or resistance liberals or Democratic establishment issue. That is not true at all. First of all, net neutrality has 83 percent support amidst people. And that is people all across the political spectrum. That's people on the left, people on the right, people in between. Uh, so this is not just some resistance liberal thing. Second of all, if it was some, quote, resistance liberal thing, Joe Biden is one of those resistance liberals, isn't he? Well, guess what? Joe Biden is against net neutrality. Was up until recently when during a task force with Bernie Sanders people promised he would have a pro-net neutrality FCC. They made Joe Biden promise that. Joe Biden didn't want to do that. Joe Biden started his campaign with a bunch of Comcast executives. His campaign started with a dinner with Comcast executives, an anti-net neutrality company. Also, Joe Biden waited, and this is one of the issues we're talking about, we talk about on this show all the time. Joe Biden waited until the 11th of the 11th of the 11th hour to even make any appointments to the FCC because the FCC has been in gridlock and Joe Biden's just let that happen. He waited a, a historic amount of time. If this was such a, a resistance liberal issue, why wouldn't have Joe Biden acted quicker on this? Because he doesn't actually care. Also, a big resistance liberal hub is MSNBC, right? I, I think we can all agree on that. How often do they cover net neutrality? Rachel Maddow, who is a Rhodes Scholar, went on MSNBC, and well, she's always on MSNBC, she works there, but she was on MSNBC, and she made it out like she didn't understand it. A Rhodes Scholar had to cover net neutrality because it was all over the news, pretended like she didn't understand it. She's like, this is a big deal. I mean, I don't even know how it's a big deal. I, I don't understand net neutrality because I'm paid not to, but it's a big deal. If this was such a, a resistance liberal issue, Rachel Maddow wouldn't have done that. So this idea that it that it's some, you know, Mick resistance, resistance liberal, you know, shit lib thing. And th those weren't his words. Those are those are mine. But but, you know, you know where the code's at there. That is just straight up not true. That is false. And, and another thing I'll mention. Uh, and again, I don't know much about this guy at all. And, and this isn't about his character. This is about the segment. But I did uh, just kind of look up his Twitter account. And he identifies as a libertarian. Again, I have no idea his stances on any other issues, and it's not relevant. But, you know, I do know that he identifies as a libertarian. And one of the things that I have noticed throughout the years is, especially when I do a segment on, say, Crosstalk, Peter Lavelle's show, which I love, Peter. I love, I love doing that show. And he has people across the political spectrum on that show. And one thing that I've noticed on more than one occasion, when I'm on a panel with people who are maybe uh, libertarian or classical conservatives, uh, you know, something of that nature, I recognize the difference between a classical conservative, a libertarian, and a GOP establishment lackey. I recognize that those are two different things. And even though I am opposed to all the ideology, I, I strongly disagree with all the ideology, I still recognize there is a difference between a classical conservative, a libertarian, and, and Rick Perry or something like that. There's a difference between them. And I recognize that. Now, all too often, I was not given the same courtesy by other people on the panel. And what I mean by that was that even though I recognize that difference for them, they did not recognize that there is a big difference between a leftist like me and Nancy Pelosi. They lumped us all in as the same. They see no difference between a, a quote, resistance liberal and an actual leftist. They lump us all together. And it annoyed me a little bit that I wasn't given the same courtesy that I extended to them. And, and I think if, if you look on some crosstalk segments, I've, I've even said similar stuff to that before. So I'm not saying that that's what this guy 
does all the time. I have no idea. But in this instance, I, I feel like he's doing a bit of that where he's just lumping, you know, and again, net neutrality has support across the political spectrum. But, you know, there's a lot of lefties who are for net neutrality and, and, and he's making it out like, oh, it's a resistance liberal thing. That's not true. And, and also it's like, again, I think there's a little bit that of that whole like, oh, the entire left is just Nancy Pelosi. No, not at all. And in, in fact, honestly, if your politics are, are libertarianism, Nancy Pelosi is a hell of a lot closer to you than she is to me. A hell of a lot closer. Just recently, Nancy Pelosi was, was on the air saying, oh, it's a free market. We're allowed to invest whatever we want. Of course, we can engage in trading. Of course, we can engage in, you know, Wall Street. It's a free market. We're capitalists. She's a hell of a lot closer to Ayn Rand than she is to a progressive or a leftist, whatever you want to call it. I mean, the word progress again, talk about words that have, you know, gotten murdered. <laughs> the word progressive also, dunzo. But you know what I mean. All right. So I feel like there was a little bit of that going on there. And it's it's misleading. And again, this is coming from the Hill where it's like their audience is at least supposedly more anti-establishment right and anti-establishment left. People that don't really fall into the vacuums of the GOP Democratic establishment. So when you're making it out like, oh, yeah, net neutrality is a Democratic establishment thing, which isn't true, um, that's sort of diminishing the issue um, in a way that I feel is very misleading uh, and dishonest. All right, so let's continue with this piece. Democracy these days. This is a side issue, but if you label absolutely everything an attack on democracy, people will start to tune you out. They might not be listening when a genuine threat to democracy, like Trump's efforts to overturn the results of the election, for instance, comes along. But I digress. Now, in order to explain why the repeal of net neutrality four years ago was treated like such a big deal, let me re-familiarize you with the concept. So the term net neutrality was coined by Columbia law professor Tim Wu in 2006. His big idea was that the government needed the power to restrict. Okay. Um, maybe I'm nitpicking a little bit here. It was not 2006. It was 2003. All right. So, so, you know, and we've all misspoken on a year before I've done it plenty of times, but the reason I point that out, I'm not trying to be like, I got you. It was 2003, <laughs> but there is a big difference. And if you guys recall during those years, the internet was really pummeling and leaps and bounds during those years in the year 2003, it wasn't crazy uncommon to at least know somebody who had not made a purchase online yet. By 2006, not so much. So there is a bit of a difference when, when it comes to the internet and policy that really concerns the internet. And you're saying something happened in 2006 when it actually happened in 2003. So I will correct that. It happened in 2003, not 2006. And net neutrality does not restrict anything. Net neutrality just requires that internet service providers treat all internet traffic equal, like it's flowing water. You can't designate fast lanes and slow lanes for consumers, and you can't make content load faster based on the content provider's ability to pay. Like, let's say Fox News or Netflix or whatever says, hey, I can pay these fees, have my stuff load faster than, you know, someone on YouTube, whatever. All right, so that's what net neutrality is, and uh, we're talking 2003, not 2006. All right, let's continue with this. Internet service providers' ability to offer different levels of service to different customers. We told the government over and over again that without rules requiring internet service providers to treat all traffic and content equally, the internet would eventually come to have many different tiers. Wealthy users would pay for digital fast lanes, while other users would end up with much slower, worse service. Now, the fact that the Internet had at that point existed and operated for years with minimal government intervention, never producing such a two-tiered system, did not deter Wu, and the Obama administration eventually agreed and, and made net neutrality part of Title II of the Communications Act of 1934. Wu now serves as an advisor on technology policy for the Biden White House. When FCC Chairman Ajit Pai... Okay, so again, we, we kind of said this 
prior. But no, we've had the idea of net neutrality around, again, in word since 2003. And they would try to get people to follow net neutrality rules. Different administrations would say, like, internet service providers have to follow net neutrality rules. Internet service providers wouldn't want to. It would get duked out in court. It came to a head in 2014 when Verizon won a court case saying, hey, these net neutrality rules they're telling us to follow, it's not an actual law. And uh, we don't want to follow it. We shouldn't have to. And the court ruled, hey, technically Verizon's right. They don't have to follow these net neutrality rules. But if you designate the internet a Title II designation, which means it's a utility, and by the way, I don't know if you noticed this, but the internet is a freaking utility in our lives, then you can have net neutrality laws. That's what the court told the FCC. So it got turned over to Tom Wheeler, who was a cable lobbyist back in his day. Tom Wheeler didn't really want to do anything. He even said, like, well, I don't know. Is that an overreach? Maybe it is. Barack Obama did promise net neutrality, uh, but he was kind of quiet about it, too, because that was, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, Barack Obama didn't keep a lot of those promises. Um, but the people spoke very loud. They spoke so loud, they crashed an FCC website multiple times, I think, which is irony that's quite beautiful. And so at the 11th hour, Tom Wheeler uh, threw a phone call from Barack Obama. Obama called him at the 11th hour, and Tom Wheeler did. Uh, they voted, and uh, the FCC did, and they designated the internet a Title II, and we had net neutrality solidified on the books. That's what actually happened. Uh, and, and we'll go through a little more of the history and deathly here after we finish up uh, some of the stuff I wanted to show in this video. But uh, let's get through this segment first, and then we'll go on to some of the other stuff. Undid the policy on December 14th, 2017. Democratic policy. So he said when Ajit Pai undid the policy in 2017, which is what happened. Uh, Donald Trump appointed Ajit Pai uh, head of the FCC. Ajit Pai was introduced, by the way, by Barack Obama because it is one big club and you ain't in it. But um, but Ajit Pai then undid net neutrality. So so that's what you know. We started in a weird place there. I just wanted to reiterate that. Policymakers and pundits widely anticipated that the end was nigh. John Oliver did multiple segments on how foolish and dangerous it was to get rid of net neutrality. Here's just a taste. Ending net neutrality would allow big companies to buy their way into the fast lane, leaving everyone else in the slow lane. Although telecom companies would prefer that you put it in a slightly different way. When you say fast lane and slow lane, it's a good illustration. But what you really should be talking about is a fast lane for everybody and a hyperspeed lane for others. Bullshit. <laughs> if we let cable companies offer two speeds of service, they won't be Usain Bolt and Usain Bolt on a motorbike. They'll, they'll be Usain Bolt and Usain Bolted to an anchor. Yeah, that was four years ago. So net neutrality was over and the apocalypse was coming and we were going to get that two-tiered system, except we didn't. Today, the internet's still here, still functioning properly, more or less. Expectations that internet service providers would practice widespread. He said more or less because there have been different instances of uh, things that have propped up because of a, a post-net neutrality world. Uh, like firefighters in California, for instance, that couldn't get their data because their data was throttled. Which uh, could have happened even with net neutrality, but because we didn't have net neutrality at the time, nothing could be done about it. Also, you had uh, digital divide. Well, digital divides isn't directly related to net neutrality, but you also had these instances where they lifted up these data caps and nothing happened, which taught everybody that, hey, these data caps are completely bullshit. There's no reason for them. We don't need them. It's just a price gouging thing. So they're already trying to get away with as much as they can. Don't you think they would try to get away with more in a post-net neutrality world? They already have data caps that are completely unnecessary. They're not necessary. The pandemic taught us that because the data caps were lifted. Nothing freaking happened. Nothing happened. The only internet that was hindered are, are places that were underserved in the first place. And again, that has nothing to do with uh, the capability of the internet. That has everything to do with price gouging and monopolies organized by the big cable companies. You don't think they would try to get away with more in a post-net neutrality world? And again, he keeps saying, well, the sky didn't fall. The sky didn't fall. Yeah, because we held the freaking line. We duked it out in court and different states passed net neutrality laws. 
we haven't seen a post net neutrality internet yet. But when you have some of the most despicable companies in the world dictating internet access, and you see what they've tried to get away with, we've highlighted a bunch of stuff on this show. Comcast, we're making these bundles available that were grossly inefficient and insufficient for people and selling them to them anyway and price gouging them during a global pandemic. AT&T doing similar things, laying off people when they promised not to. AT&T did that. These are some of the most despicable companies in the world. And you're saying, well, if we didn't have net neutrality, of course they wouldn't push their life. Of course they wouldn't have designated fast lanes and slow lanes. Of course they wouldn't have um, agreements with some content providers over others. And if people could pay the fees, their stuff would load faster. You really think that? That's, that's like saying, hey, um, the Green River Killer lives in our neighborhood. We don't need to have laws against murder. Why bother? Let, let's just, I wouldn't kill anybody. Would you kill anybody? No. So let's just do away with laws about murder. The Green River Killer's right there. But I'm, I'm sure he, I don't think he's looking. He hasn't killed anybody yet. All right. So let, let's see if there's more to this. Uh, there, there is more, but we're not going to watch the whole thing. Spread in proper disc discrimination didn't pan out. On the contrary, the internet is better and faster for basically everybody than it was when net neutrality ended. In and we explained why multiple times, but uh, all right. In fact, it's better and faster than at any point in past history. Th that's because the, the technology keeps going. The technology keeps moving. Oh, you want to know another reason why that is? Not to conflate issues, but another reason why that is, is because there's more municipal broadband in the country than ever before. And people are realizing like, hey, internet infrastructure isn't some rocket science thing. And if we turn it over to our city, instead of these for-profit cable companies that are trying to price gouge us, we might get better internet at a better price. That's part of the reason the internet's better for everyone. There's more freaking municipal broadband, which offers better internet at a better price than the big cable competitors 100% of the time. So even, even uh, uh, Robbie here admits to that, and that's the reason why. He admits, hey, the internet's like better than ever before. Yeah, that's why. And uh, we still technically, even though it is not a federal law in the books, we still do have net neutrality. We've not seen a true post-net neutrality internet before, but they have pushed their luck. They Even in this short amount of time, even with this short amount of time and a global pandemic thrown into the mix, they've pushed their luck. All right. Indeed, to the extent we're concerned about people being wrongly denied internet services, we're actually largely talking about social media, not internet service providers. Facebook, Twitter, and Google make different policies resulting in all sorts of different kinds of content treatment decisions for very- This has nothing to do with net neutrality. So now he's blending issues. And again, I don't know why he's doing this. I don't know if it's intentional, but- Social media content moderation has nothing to do with net neutrality. Though those are two separate things. And he's blending them as if they're the same or, or even related. They're, they're really not. Net neutrality has to do with your internet service provider, Comcast, AT&T, Cox, whatever it may be. Or if you're lucky and you live in a place like Chattanooga, Tennessee, your city, it means their ability. They have to treat internet traffic like flowing water. They can't, they can't be like, oh, wait, where's that from? No, that, that goes to the slow lane. Who's that to? Well, that goes to the other slow lane. Oh, that goes to the fast lane. Oh, that's from uh, Netflix. They paid the fee, so it goes to the fast lane. Oh, that's from YouTube. Ah, they didn't pay the fee. That goes to slow lane. Oh, that's from some random guy's website. Oh, put that in the slowest lane. They didn't pay any fees. It prohibits them from doing that. And instead, the internet, whether you are on YouTube or CNN or Fox News or BBC or whatever, somebody's Twitter account, whatever it may be, internet traffic flows equally. And you can't have designated fast and slow lanes for consumers. That's what net neutrality is. It has nothing to do with social media platforms making editorial decisions. That, that, that has nothing. That's a whole separate issue. And we've talked about that issue too plenty. But that has nothing to do with net neutrality. They're just they're just two separate things. All right. So I think we're pretty much done here, but we'll see see if there's anything else I wanted to highlight here.
various people for different reasons. Your internet service provider, for the most part, doesn't do that sort of thing. Nathan Lemer, a former advisor to Pi and a current public affairs executive, pointed out on Twitter yesterday that the chicken littles of net neutrality never recanted their dire predictions. His Twitter thread included some... It's because we haven't seen a post-net neutrality world. That's like saying, oh, there was snow this winter and all the climate scientists didn't recant their dire predictions. <laughs> yeah, we haven't really seen a post-net neutrality world yet. But based on uh, years of behavior from big cable companies, we don't want to see that world. But okay. Rather hilarious examples, the front page of CNN.com declared the end of the internet as we know it under a breaking news tab. When, uh, when Breaking news! A corporate media outlet uses an attention-grabbing headline. I can't believe it. This is the first and only time that has happened ever. CNN did it for a net neutrality story. One of a very few, I promise you. Why didn't he pull out the segment of Rachel Maddow pretending she can't understand it? What about that segment? Net neutrality was gotten rid of. This was a news story, not an opinion piece. Senate Democrats made an equally extreme claim that without net neutrality, the Internet would load one word at a time. That's what that, that tweet is indicating. Uh, needless to say, that didn't happen. Senator Ron Wyden said to expect digital serfdom. We're still waiting for that. Of course, celebrities got in on it. Here was Alyssa Milano. Uh, the internet, watch, watch the FCC, watch the Trump administration destroy the internet. The internet is not destroyed, however, it's four years later. Lemur also points out that Pi got mountains of harassment and death threats against his family. That would, of course, have been wrong, regardless, even if his policy change was a really bad idea. But as it turns out, yeah, nothing happened to the internet. The apocalypse. Again, because we have not seen the effects of a uh, post-net neutrality world. And uh, also another thing he didn't point out there, if we're talking about, um, you know, different people's responses, how about all the fake sock puppet accounts that sent in fake anti-net neutrality comments to the FCC? Why didn't he mention that? Because that happened. We covered it on this show. They sent in a bunch of fake uh, anti-net neutrality comments to make it seem like public opinion was in a place where it wasn't. They didn't mention that part. Now, here's a little bit of, uh, of backup. So some of the stuff we're talking about. That's it for the video. Uh, here is a brief history on actual net neutrality. So just a little bit of backup to some of the stuff we're saying. Oh, gosh darn it. It got, okay. Net neutrality is the idea that internet service providers like uh, Comcast and Verizon should treat all content flowing through their cables and cell towers equally. That means they shouldn't be able to uh, slide some data into fast lanes while blocking or otherwise discriminating against other material. In other words, these companies, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The FCC, so here's the big history here, which, which kind of goes against all the stuff that they said in that segment. The FCC spent years under both Bush and Obama administrations, this is pre-Trump, trying to enforce net neutrality protections after a series of legal defeats at the hands of broadband providers. So in other words, they were duking this out in court for years and cable companies had to follow net neutrality rules while they were duking it out. Um, so the FCC passed a sweeping net neutrality order in 2015, but in December, 2017, the now Republican controlled um, FCC voted to jettison that order. Net neutrality advocates have long argued that keeping the internet an open playing field is crucial for innovation um, and let's see the history of net neutrality. Columbia university law professor, Tim Wu coined the term network neutrality in 2003, not 2006, 2003 about online discrimination. At the time, some broadband providers, including Comcast banned home internet users from accessing VPNs while others like AT&T banned users from using Wi-Fi routers. Wu worried that broadband providers tendency to restrict new technologies would hurt innovation in the long term. So in other words, he had the foresight to realize we have to have the internet um, protected this way because these companies are already price gouging. They're already seeing what they can get away with. They're going to start messing with our internet traffic if we let them. And he's right because guess what? They did. And guess what? They've been taking it to court. They fought this tooth and nail and they're still fighting it. There's cable lobbyists saying they're doing everything they can to try to make sure that Biden doesn't appoint Gigi Sohn to the FCC because they want the FCC to stay in a gridlock. They know that Gigi Sohn is a pro-net neutrality vote. If she gets appointed the way she should, there will be a pro-net neutrality FCC. 
Cable lobbyists are fighting that tooth and nail. They don't want that so that the FCC stays in a grid lot so we don't get net neutrality back on the books. Why would they do that if they don't plan on uh, bringing about a post-net neutrality internet? All right, so here's some of the history. The Bush era FCC took a first pass at these uh, anti-discrimination rules in 2005. It prohibited internet service providers from blocking legal content or preventing customers, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the FCC ordered Comcast in 2008 to stop slowing connections that use uh, P2P file sharing. So basically, they made these companies follow net neutrality rules because these cable companies would see what they could get away with. And the court would say, oh, stop doing that. In 2010, the Obama era FCC passed a more detailed net neutrality order. This is all pre-2015, by the way. All pre-2015. They were battling stuff out in court in the mid-2000s. 2005, there was something. 2008, there was something else. 2010, more detailed net neutrality order. Oh, and by the way, throughout all of this, throughout all of this, from 2004 and beyond, there were digital rights enthusiasts that were screaming at the top of their lungs to get net neutrality on the books as a law. How do I know this? Because I was freaking one of them. So in 2010, the Obama era passed a more detailed net neutrality order. Again, all pre. So here's where the turning point happened. In 2014, Verizon sued. And the court said, hey, Verizon's right here. But if you designate the internet a Title II, which means it's a utility, then you can have net neutrality. And we know what happened next. So that's a little backup for some of the stuff I was saying here. Now, now look, again... I really don't like doing these segments where you like watch something, some like you're you're like opining on people who opine, and it's just a it's just a web of opine world. And I don't do it often, but in this case, I mean, first of all, net neutrality is a big flagship issue for this show. Net neutrality, municipal broadband, digital rights in general, big issue for this show. And it really did surprise me to see what is considered. I mean, I mean, that's supposed to be kind of an alternative media outlet, right? To an extent. I, I mean, would you call the Hill? I guess you can make the case the Hill's kind of corporate. I, I don't, I mean, whatever. It's neither here nor there, really. But I was surprised to see something like that out of the Hill. At this point, I would be surprised to see something like that even out of a cable news network because these points are just so... Um, off center like like they're just incorrect they're just completely misrepresenting the issue and, and they're really trying to diminish the issue by making these points of association that this isn't a big thing by likening it to people who actually aren't even really working for it okay that's nice you got a you got a nice sound bite of nancy pelosi talking net neutrality that that's fine but look at action look at Gigi Stone still not appointed. They're dragging their feet on it. Joe Biden waited a historic amount of time to even address this. Started his campaign with Comcast executives. Yeah, making it out like, oh, this is some resistance liberal thing. No, it isn't. This is about a free and open internet or not. And that's why it has support across political spectrums and the support of over 83% of people. So very disappointing to see this come out of the hill. Very, very disappointing. And um, all right. <laughs> so I know not a lot of places cover net neutrality, but it's one of the things that we do cover a lot here on Get Your News On With Ron. And we will be moving forward in 2022. Get your news on with Ron. Don't you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Get your news on with Ron. Don't you wanna know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tweet me an article at Ron Placone. We'll go through it together and make it our own. Get your news on with Ron. 